Um, tonight, we're here to celebrate the new novel by Amir Ahmadi Aryan, uh, Then the Fish Swallowed Him. The book follows an apolitical bus driver in Tehran who is taken to a prison for political dissidents, uh, where he develops a disturbing but interdependent relationship with his interrogator. And we're very happy to have Amir here with us tonight. Um, Amir is an Iranian novelist and journalist. He's written two critically acclaimed novels and a book of nonfiction in Farsi. In English, his short stories and essays have appeared in the New York Times, the Paris Review, the Guardian, Lit Hub, London Review of Books, Witness Magazine, Massachusetts Review, and uh, other places. He holds a PhD in comparative literature from the University of Queensland, Australia, and an MFA in creative writing from NYU. He currently teaches literature and creative writing at City College, New York. Um, then the Fish Swallowed Him is available from Booksmith, and I'll drop that link in the comments. Um, I hope also in the comments, please add any questions you have. We will do a Q&A at the end of the program. So I think that's it for me. Amir, thank you uh, so much for joining us, um, and congratulations on the book. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So yeah, thanks everybody for uh, being here this evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, this novel uh, is a story of a bus driver, as Evan pointed out. So this is a guy who has been a nobody uh, pretty much for his whole life. He has uh, driven a bus uh, around Tehran and you know just picking up passengers and dropping them off around the city. And uh, uh, through meeting one of his uh, friends, it's like an accidental, you know, uh, meeting, or he, he kind of comes across one of his colleagues. Uh, he gets introduced into the bus drivers' union in Tehran, and the year is like 2004, 2005. And uh, so he joins the union, and then you know, uh, after that, uh, there's a strike that the union has organized. He joins this strike as well. And uh, so the, when they actually stage the strike, it's in a uh, bus terminal west of Tehran, it gets violent and bloody. And so the day after the strike, he's, uh, you know, arrested and taken to Evan prison uh, north of Tehran. So it's a prison for, uh, you know, political dissidents and uh, activists and, you know, uh, the, the, those kinds of people, other people as well, but it's known for, you know, being a place for political prisoners. So then uh, most of the novel is actually set in the prison. Uh, and uh, we kind of alternate back and forth between his solitary cell, you know, there are like a few chapters in the book about him being just on his own in, a sol in solitary confinement and the interrogation room where he spends time with uh, his interrogator, his name is Haj Saeed. And uh, yeah, so the, the, the interrogator kind of digs deep into his li life to, you know, basically to find any kind of dirt that they can make him confess to uh, the crimes he has not committed and so on and so forth. I'm not gonna spoil the story. So, uh, what I'm going to read is somewhere from the middle of the book, uh, is a couple of pages. It starts on page 107, for those of you who have the book. And uh, so by at this point, uh, the, the protagonist, his name is Eunice, by the way, he is in a solitary cell sitting, and uh, he sees a fly kind of flying around the cell. Then I saw a fly, the insect, fresh from the free world, was sitting on a slat in front of the open window, rubbing its feelers together. It seemed to be deciding whether to come inside or turn around and fly back out. Its body made a dot on the narrow strip of light between the window slats. The position of its black shadow created the illusion that the edges of the slats bent in toward themselves and made the fly look bigger than it really was. It eventually made up its mind and launched itself into the cell. It maneuvered around briefly, took note of the walls and the ceiling, and alighted back on the slat. Please stay a little longer. 
The words left my mouth before I had even thought of uttering them. The fly stopped rubbing its legs like it was weighing my offer. Then it tiptoed to the side of the sled and stood in profile to me. I came to my knees and followed its moves closely. The fly flew into the room again. It floated straight toward me, circled, drifted out, looped back around and hovered near my face. I closed my eyes and listened with pleasure to its delicate ear stroking buzz. Then the fly approached the window but pulled back quickly. It made another turn around the cell and paused over the toilet bowl, carved out short circles in the air, lowered the altitude as meticulously as a helicopter carrying wounded soldiers, and landed on the vomit smear. It jabbed its proboscis into the dry vomit and began to feast. When it had eaten its fill, the fly tore its body off the toilet and took another pass around the cell. It approached the slats three times, pulled away at the last second, and returned to hover over my head. It then sped up and zigzagged, swooped down, and landed on my arm. Goosebumps rose up on my skin under its feet. It tiptoed around up to my elbow and back to the middle of my arm and paused there. I watched it with admiration. It seemed like a perfect machine. Even the coloring was beautiful with its gradual change from black to gray. Its body was tiny and frail and about a quarter of it supported the disproportionately large compound eyes that captured the world in a thousand simultaneous discrete images. Its feelers settled on my skin and rubbed one another at a carefully calculated frequency, gathering data, or perhaps just enjoying the company of the only other living organism in the cell. The dogs are very loud here. How do you fly? I asked the insect. You feed an unshed and vomit, but you can go wherever you want. How? The legs of the fly stopped moving along my arm. It must have sensed the threat. How? How the fuck is that fair? The fly took off and flitted around anxiously near the ceiling. Look, I'm sorry, I said to the insect. My voice, my voice grew shrill. I didn't mean it. I just want to get out of here. The fly ignored me and continued tracing warp circles in the air. Then it accelerated suddenly, yanked around, and started flying into the walls. It was suddenly desperate to escape, but couldn't find the way out. It lurched right before correcting its trajectory toward the mesh of the window screen. In a second, it would find it. I jumped up and moved as fast as I could to block the egress. The fly collided with my chest and dove back into the cell, then flew around hysterically. The sudden jump had hurt my knee. I needed to sit and stretch my legs, but couldn't take the risk. I glared at the fly, offended by its escape attempt. It had fed off my vomit and walked up and down my arm. I could have killed it, and the fly knew it well because it lived in the world of human beings, but I hadn't. It now wanted to go just because I had asked a question. The fly continued on its quest. It checked every inch of the cell for another crack or hole that could offer freedom. The more it tried to escape, the more agitated I got. When the insect had determined there was no other passage to the outside world, it settled on the wall. Listen, I said, I meant no harm. I just want you to stay a little while and keep me company. It's very lonely here. 
The flag took up again, spiraling and plunging, making abrupt turns and jags. The pain intensified in my knee. It radiated out from my kneecap, spread and circled around the joint. My body implored me to sit and stretch my legs, but I couldn't give the fly a chance to escape. It landed back on the wall, its rear to the ceiling, its head at an angle that enabled it to monitor all my moves. I noticed an unsettling tilt to its body, an adjustment that I took to mean it had dedicated the full capacity of its compound eye machinery to discovering a way to break free. I imagined how I looked to the insect, blurred and twisted, refracted into thousands of tiny replicas of myself, all trapped in the cell. My knee hurt worse. I couldn't stand much longer. Since I had decided not to let the fly go, I had to either kill or catch it. Killing it would have defeated the purpose and catching it would be hard. But I had trapped flies as a child. I would bend my palm into a scoop and hold it parallel to the wall near the body of the insect. The fly would take off when my hand got too close and then I would pounce on it, keep it in my fist, letting it buzz and struggle to get out. When it stopped, I would put it on the floor. The flies never died, but their wings would usually be damaged beyond repair. The insects would be my pets for about a few hours before they succumbed to their wounds. I had to take two steps to the wall where the fly was perched. If I took the first one quietly without scaring it, I would be close enough to attack. I rehearsed the operation in my mind, then slowly set down one foot. The fly rubbed its leg, seemingly unaware of my intentions. Then my other foot sprang forward. My right hand cleaved the air above the insect but didn't reach it. A fraction of a second before I got to it, pain struck. I froze mid-step. My leg gave way, my body thudded to the floor. From there, I watched the fly take off from the wall. It moved erratically through the space over my fallen body. When it had confirmed that I was no longer dangerous, its motion became nonchalant. It floated around, circled the cell, circled the cell and lingered triumphantly over me. Then it flew through the window slash to its freedom. I lay there on my back, looking around at the walls, longing in vain for a moment, for a movement, a sound, anything that would make me feel that I had not been abandoned. From the floor, I cursed and insulted the creature, threatening to kill it the next time it showed up. Then I lay motionless, listening to a silence so thunderous it sounded like a waterfall in my ears, finding the magnitude of my loneliness unbearable. Soon I found myself consumed by memory, the events of one childhood evening I hadn't thought of in decades. Okay, thank you uh, for listening. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions. That was wonderful, Amir. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm. Uh, we're. We're happy to take questions um, from anyone who who's watching at home. I haven't received any yet, but um, I, I can maybe start us off with a question or two. Um, that was a, a really beautiful passage, and I'm. I'm wondering if um, you could talk just a little bit about the inspiration for the book. Uh, how How did it start? Um, and and kind of take you into this this cell um, with with this prisoner. Yeah. So by the way, I'm sorry for the dogs. And it's not it's not you know common here to have like dogs barking at each other on the street. But yeah, it's, it's like this you know it's a, you know Zoom life. Um, the book uh, it's actually based on a kind of a real event. Uh, in 2004, 2005, there was a, you know, strike uh, 
uh, uh, organized or orchestrated by the bus drivers union in Tehran, in the, the west of Tehran. So, and I happened to live there at the time, like near the bus uh, terminal where the events of this book, you know, uh, take place. Like the first chapter of this book is set in a bus terminal where I used to live near, near. And, uh, yeah, what I noticed was that, so what they did was, you know, the buses just start, stopped working for a few days, for I think for about three days. And, uh, you know, uh, Tehran is like a very big city, a city of 15 million people. And at the time, you know, it's like before uh, subway in the city. So the most of the public transportation was, you know, uh, being done by buses. So, you know, a, a lot of like the burden of public transportation on, was on the shoulder of bus drivers. And when they s just stopped working, that part of the city was, was basically apocalyptic. I mean, it was totally chaotic and, uh, you know, crazy. People were just swarming around on the street. Nobody knew where to go and uh, what to do. And so what I noticed for the first time uh, after the revolution, after the 1979 revolution, was like the power of a uh, workers' union, which was something I was totally unaware of. I, you know, I had never kind of paid attention to that. But for the first time, I noticed that, you know, uh, an organization uh, comprised of uh, just workers, like simple workers, bus drivers, can exercise such a power that, you know, they can basically shut down a city and, like, make the, make the government really, like, fluster around for, for a solution. And so that stayed with me. Uh, and, uh, yeah, over years, I kept kind of going back to uh, those events and thinking about them. And, uh, yeah, I started kind of reading more about the Bus Drivers Union and other workers union in, in Iran. And they've been pretty strong and, and effective over time. And learn a lot about them. And yeah, I started writing this book in 2016, uh, four years ago. So about 10 years after uh, I uh, witnessed those events. Yeah. That's wonderful. What um, I'm wondering about the, the relationship between the, um, the bus driver and the interrogator. How did, how did that come about for you? Well, it's also uh, based on a lot of, Kind of conversations I had with people who have been in Evan in, in that prison. So yeah, in, in Iran I was involved in politics, you know, kind of a lot. And uh, I mean, un unfortunately, when you're in, involved in politics there, you're likely to have friends who have spent time in, in that prison, you know, and, and almost all of them spent some time in solitary uh, in Evan. So. I haven't, I mean, I've been like uh, interrogated, but I've never been inside that prison. So I started talking to folks who uh, had that experience, especially the solitary part, because, you know, what I noticed was that uh, when you read prison novels from all over the world and not just Iran, and there's a lot of them, you know, especially in countries that have like a similar kind of political situation, uh, you know, like Latin American novels of the 60s and the 70s or uh, Middle Eastern novels, of the 70s and I mean more like Egyptian or Palestinian authors uh, they wrote a lot of prison books so I read uh, those books and what I noticed was that this solitary confinement is basically absent from most of them you know I hadn't really read a prison novel that is kind of devoted to the solitary experience right it's usually in the beginning uh, early on in the book, the, you know, the person goes to solitary, like maybe in a, in a chapter or two, or even less usually, like a few passages. And then they go out to, you know, the, the other parts of uh, prison where, where other people are there. And understandably, I mean, it's basically like an impossible situation for a novelist, right? Writing solitary confinement because just one person in the room. There's no action, no dialogue, no interaction, no movement. There's nothing there. And it's really hard to kind of move the narrative forward with just uh, somebody's mind wandering around. Like, you've got to really find uh, ways of uh, kind of driving the story ahead. 
So, yeah, so uh, I was, I, I talked to those people a lot and uh, the inter <clears throat> and uh, I gathered probably more than a dozen pretty extensive, you know, accounts of time in prison and uh, their interactions with their interrogators. And yeah, this, this book is basically like a dramatization and fiction. The character of interrogator is like you know, an amalgamation of a bunch of interrogators I heard about uh, from uh, from my friends, and so is there. You know, they're like elements of real interrogators kind of combined into one character here. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I, I muted myself there. I uh, I was going to ask you what kind of research you did for this book, and and. Yeah. Um, and uh, it makes sense that, that you talked to some of the, the uh, taxi drivers. Um, did you, um, was there any, any research that you did about the prison itself? Um, what, what was that like? And also, did you, um, were there any books that you referenced uh, uh, specifically for, um, for this kind of uh, a setting? Yeah, for prison, I, I mean, again, I, I talked to people who've been there, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, their experience is very limited because they're blindfolded when they go into the prison and uh, all the way down to the, to the cell and, you know, in the corridors and every, everywhere. The only places the blindfolds are off are in the cell and inside the interrogation room. And uh, so, yeah, they couldn't have, like, the, like a precise... Uh, you know, like a plan of prison. Uh, but there are books out there. There are you know, like sources, but no, none of them are translated to English. So, yeah. Uh, then there's one guy who spent, I think, more than 10 years in Evan and now is a refugee in Sweden. He wrote a, a book in like three volumes about the, this very, very detailed account of uh, the prison and you know like it's planned there are like maps of uh, uh, pr prison and, yeah, I, I didn't even know before reading that book that there are like, three different floors of mm. cells on top of each other and uh, yeah so uh, I learned about you know how the prison is basically set up through those conversation and uh, conversations and reading those accounts. But it's still uh, I, I'm I'm not still sure if there is any you know uh, text or document that, that gives you like the final word about uh, what the prison is like. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure there probably isn't, huh? Yeah. Um, what? Uh, how? How did? this compare to to your previous books? I mean, obviously, this was in English and the others were in Farsi. Um, so maybe yeah. you could talk a little bit about the difference uh, of writing in English um, versus versus Farsi. And also, I'm, I'm just curious what um, the difference was in terms of um, uh, that kind of big unknown of, of not having been been to this prison. And, and um, were, were you essentially, I guess, um, relying on um, a different kind of research than for your other books. Um, how, how did that compare? Well, the book, this book is not reliant on the prison sort of plan, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's in the cell and in the interrogation room. It's only in the beginning when he is taken to prison, it goes through different stages. So, yeah, it didn't matter that much if I didn't, completely like get it right like the whole you know plan of the prison right so it's it's very sort of uh, claustrophobic and uh uh yeah like circumscribed right where the character is and um my other books uh, you know i the, my other novels one of them is about a a, a journalist who sort of disappears kind of out of the blue and no one knows what happened to him. And so the narrator of that book is uh, is his friend, his childhood friend. Or that's what he claims. We are never quite sure about it, the accuracy of his claims. So he claims to be his, his close friend. And now, so he's writing this book to tell us what happened to him, right? But, you know, be, because the narrator is not entirely reli reliable either, you know, there are like other mysteries that kind of creep in. And the first novel was about two guys who don't know each other, but you know they're like kind of they're, the the way they live sort of 
affect each other's fate. And uh, you know, it's, like, it's like a butterfly effect kind of idea of two people living in a city without knowing each other, yet, yet you know, randomly their, their, paths, their paths cross. And uh, so eventually in the end of the book, one of them kills the other one in a car accident. And it's a short novel. So yeah, those books, um, they're not really, there's not a lot of like similarities between these one, this one and the other two, maybe except for politics, really. You know, they all, all of them are set against like a, uh, the, the, the background of the contemporary politics of Iran, especially the last two, this one and the, the story of the journalist, maybe not so much the first one. And uh, with uh, respect to writing in two different languages, I mean, they're just such different experiences, you know, and, uh, which I didn't even expect, right? And uh, I thought that I would, uh, it, it would be the same writer, like the, you know, the same sort of self who wrote those two books, now writing it in a different language, but that's not the case at all, right? at least not for me. You almost become a different person when you write a book in a different language. And uh, yeah, it's like a new kind of self emerges in your head that you, you didn't even exist before. And yeah, so it kind of comes out from, comes out of a different sort of uh, linguistic universe. And uh, yeah, it's totally different. I was very surprised by the experience myself. It's beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, um, well, uh, first, I, I have a question um, uh, from Adrian, who, who's writing, um, he's wondering if there is a plan, if there are plans uh, to issue a version of this novel in Farsi. Yeah, that's, I would love to uh, have it translated. The thing is, I cannot translate myself, which is kind of ironic, because I used to, you know, like work as a translator but yeah i don't know it's like a mental block that i have or every time i you know start translating myself not this one i, have, I tried translating my short stories before mm. and none of that really worked like i never you know got past like the second paragraph uh, when i was translating myself so i don't know it kind of i, I cannot uh, you know stay sort of faithful to, to my own text I kept changing it. So yeah, hopefully I will find someone to do it. The thing is I can't publish this novel in Iran because, you know, it, it won't get licensed. They, they, it goes through like a censorship process and they issue mm -hmm. like a license. And so I can't just, uh, I just, you can't just put it out there. But this is the kind of story that, that, that won't be allowed to kind of come into, you know, the market. So I have to publish it on the ground. As a result of that, it, it's going to be very hard to find a translator because that person has to work for free, basically. You know? mm. so, I was going to I was going to ask if it felt politically different to write in English. I mean, it's uh, you know when you don't have like this blade of censorship uh, near your neck. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very different. Yeah, this is a book I couldn't write in Farsi at all. You know, it's, uh, and the, the, the subject is basically untouchable there. And uh, yeah, that's uh, actually the, probably like the, the main reason I'm writing in English is censorship. You know, I was perfectly comfortable with my native tongue and I, you know, I could write it pretty well and uh, I've established like a life and career as a writer back there. But uh, it was just not sustainable, you know, in terms of just censorship I had. I wrote one uh, novel, another is a collection of novellas. Both of them were banned, you know, and uh, uh, yeah, you can't really live like that as a writer. You know, you spend like three years putting together a book and somebody with just a snap of finger kills it. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, but that was pretty much uh, the switch to English was probably my only way to, you know, my only choice really to kind of continue to be a writer. Wow. Um, and, and so uh, do, you, do you see uh, your, your, at least your fiction work um, being in English going forward for, for the time being? Are you, are you working on a project right now? 
Yeah, I'm working on something. Yeah, I'm probably for the foreseeable future, if not for the rest of my life, I'll probably be writing in English. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm working on a couple of things now. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, any any sneak peeks or too too new to oh, yeah, discuss yeah. it? One of them is uh, sort of two uh, friends who kind of grew up uh, in south of Iran during the Iran Iraq War in the eighties, and uh, so they kind of come together to Tehran to go to university, and their paths sort of diverge, but then you know they kind of meet each other again. It's a basically it's a, it's a long novel, and it's going to be. You know that uh, those books that uh, you know, cover like a long span of history. It, it starts from the '80s and ends in 2007. Oh wow! And, uh, there's like two guys kind of growing up in, in Iran, and yeah, and I was thinking that you know the the story of just an average person growing up in the post-revolutionary in Iran has never been told in English. Actually, you know the 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 novels that you have here are about Iran, almost all of them are written by Iranian Americans and yeah, none of them grew up there. Yeah, none of them like, saw that world uh, up close, they experienced it firsthand. And uh, then people who are there, they don't write in English or what they write is never translated to English. So there's a, there's a gap here that no one has filled. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to do that, right? I'm, I'm trying to write uh, this. Actually, this book is also another story of that kind, but how, you know, like a, a politicized bus driver in Iran, right? What, what, who is that person? You know, what, that, that's, a, that's a, like a kind of a person no one knows anything about outside the country. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, there's, uh, there are like tons and tons of pretty good stories and a lot of them very dark and, uh, you know, sad stories, but very important ones, especially like, uh, you know, it's, uh, for, for, for the U.S., it's, uh, Iran is a country that's like in the headlines all the time, but no one really knows anything about how an actual human being lives in Iran like day to day, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm trying to just have like a bunch of projects uh, to just write the stories of those people and it's all obviously going to be limited to my experience too, right? I live this. I'm a man, you know. I'm probably. A, uh, I don't have like a, at least so far. I haven't. Uh, I don't have a story of like you know with a female protagonist. Maybe in the future I would. Uh, or uh, yeah, I'm like middle class, and you know I'm like educated, and all of that. With all the limits that you know come in with my character and my background as a writer. But nevertheless, you know, even my uh, experience or my universe has never been articulated in, in English, that kind of life experience. So, yeah, I'm going to do that. And, uh, yeah, probably, yeah, uh, for years to come, you know, the, like the few uh, future projects will be uh, uh, like that. It sounds wonderful. And it's important work. So thank you for doing it. Yeah, thank you. And, um I, uh, I just put out a final call um, uh, for questions. Um, um, so I, I have another one um, uh, from Adrian as well, who is asking, uh, are there a lot of pre-revolutionary novels published in Iran today? True revolutionary? Uh, pre. Uh, as Pre-revolutionary. In, uh, mm-hmm. Well, yeah, there, there is, but it depends what... Uh, what they're about, you know, there is like a, a desire to kind of rewrite the history there, right? right? So uh, then the, they have like it's very kind of particular uh, rendition of what the pre-revolutionary Iran was like, and uh, so you have like a corrupt monarch, and you know, it's just uh, like American uh, lapdog and, and all of that. And uh, so that's the kind of story, uh, you know, there's, there's not a, like, a lot of room for maneuver if you're a novelist, you want to write about a pre-revolutionary Iran. So there's a bunch out there, but I, I don't know if any of them is pretty good or I, w- I would recommend to anyone to read. Because, uh, again, because of censorship, we can't really tell those stories. Post, post-revolutionary as well, right? You know, uh, yeah, it's just again that so so many stories are just left on the ground there. There's no one to pick them up. 
Well, well, thank you for telling them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and, and congratulations on this book. Uh, the passage you read is beautiful. I look forward to reading the rest of it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And, and I, hope, um, I hope that we get to, um, to host you in person sometime. Uh, uh, yeah, hopefully. Do, do you ever make it out to the West Coast? I mean, uh, yeah, uh, well, right now, no one makes that. Of course, anyway. of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, course. Yeah, in the future, I would love to. Yeah, I've been there a couple of times. And uh, yeah, I really love California and the area and, and L.A. And yeah, I have friends there. But, yeah, hopefully, you know, maybe hopefully with the next book. Well, please, please consider us. Send us a line Absolutely. anytime. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Amir. And um, thank you to everybody who's tuning in. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, the, the book um, is Then the Fish Swallowed Him. We're, we're here with Amir Amadi Aryan. Um, I will drop the, uh, the book link in the comments again. Um, uh, I, think, I think that's it for today. Thank you, Amir, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care and stay well. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Mm -hmm.